So something I really hate about movies right now, about seeing movies right now, and uh, this applies pre-Covidian, I don't mean right now, right now, you know, is that it is almost impossible to not see the Rotten Tomatoes score before you see the movie. I, I don't like to see it, I like to go into things blind just so that, like, I, I'll see it afterwards, I'll look at it afterwards, but I, I like to form my own opinion, so I, I like to not have that in the back of my head when I'm going to see a movie. But it's really hard not to, like, it'll get put in thumbnails for videos about stuff, or it, it's the first thing that comes up when you Google, you have to not Google the movie. One really annoying case of this was Godzilla King of the Monsters. Months, months before the movie came out, I stopped Googling it. I didn't want to see the score before I saw the movie. And so, day of, still haven't seen it. I've been, I've been good. And uh, I go on the website to buy tickets. And it's on the website to buy tickets. It's on the movie theater's website. They have the right. So, uh, <laughs> I like Dear Evan Hansen. Dear Evan Hansen, the musical, I got into it around the time, you know, that everyone got into musicals. I was listening to my Bim Bam, I found out about Hamilton, I listened to Hamilton, I was like, oh, this is amazing. And then I saw animatics for Hamilton, and I saw animatics for other musicals, I saw animatics for Dear Evan Hansen, I thought, oh, Dear Evan Hansen, can I listen to that like I listened to Hamilton? You can't, because you're missing out on the whole story. So I, shh, don't, don't tell anyone, got a bootleg, don't tell anyone, and I saw it, and... It was fantastic. I love it. Well, they're lovely, lovely people. Yeah. They don't know you. And you do? <laughs> I thought I did. What? What do you know about me? You don't know anything about me. You never even see me. Thanks. I am trying my best. They like me. Yes, I know how hard that is to believe that. They don't think I'm like, that there's something wrong with me, that I need to be fixed like you do. Okay, wait, yes, wait, yeah, wait, no, wait, no, wait. No, no, no. I have to go to therapy. I have to take drugs. I'm your mother. <laughs> my job is to take care you're of you. I know I'm such a burden. I'm the worst thing that ever happened to you. I just, I ruined your life. So. You? I'm the only, the one good thing that's ever happened to me, Evan. Sorry, I can't give you anything more than that. <laughs> Shit. Um, I know not everyone loves it. It's kind of divisive, but I personally really like it. And something you might know about me if you've listened to my Sonic the Hedgehog screenplay, that's the sentence, is that I care a lot about portrayals of suicide in media, and I think Darevan Hansen actually did a really good job. The play, I think, did a really good job. It doesn't show Connor's note, it doesn't describe how Connor died, it doesn't do everything great, but it does it sufficiently, and what makes it important to me is that it's not really about Connor committing suicide, it's about Evan surviving suicide, which uh, there aren't like a lot of portrayals of that, of surviving suicide, because if you want to make a thing about suicide, you want to show the suicide. And that makes it a really powerful source of comfort, I think. It walks a fine line, but in my opinion, the play manages to justify the tricky and dangerous topics it treads into. And that was the thing I was most worried about with the movie. They made a novelization of the play, which I wanted to read, and then I found it in a store one time, I picked it up, read the first page, and I was like, this is doing the things I didn't want it to do. So, I was really worried that the movie would also do those things. Uh, spoilers, it didn't. And then, uh, in 2019, yeah, yeah, I got to go to New York and I got to see Dear Evan Hansen on Broadway. And I cried the whole two hours. <laughs> I was just <laughs> so that obviously was a really important experience to me. And how this all loops around back to the Godzilla thing I was talking about, the Ron Tomatoes thing. It's kind of hard not to have noticed by now that the Dear Evan Hansen movie is getting terrible reviews. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard people saying it's bad. But today is, uh, oh, we're 11.14, so we're still today. Today is Friday, the 24th of September, so it is the day that it came out widely in theaters, not counting TIFF first day I was able to see it and I made it without seeing the Rotten Tomatoes score. I still haven't seen it. I'm going to now look up the Rotten Tomatoes score for Dear Evan Hansen and you're gonna see me seeing it for the first time. Rotten Tomatoes 34%. Uh-huh. Cool. So I loved it. <laughs> Something I didn't notice until after I recorded this is that the critic score is around 33%, but the audience score is around 93%. So, uh, I don't know what that means. I guess I'm not as alone as I felt. You are not alone. 
Yeah, yeah, shut up. I also forgot to mention that when I saw it in the theater, it got a round of applause at the end. And I didn't even start it. <laughs> this channel, if this is the first thing of mine you're seeing, uh, I, I made it in 2015. I called it Brightside Reviews, and I wanted to do reviews of movies that most people didn't like, and I wanted to defend them. I wanted to say that I liked them and say why. And it now kind of feels like I did that for this, because this is like the first time I've really felt like something I was looking forward to. Actually, not, I wasn't looking forward to it. I was dreading it because I'd heard the reviews were bad. And then I saw it and I loved it and everybody else hated it. So now it's on me to explain why. And you, you know what, I, I kinda don't care about convincing you. <laughs> I'm gonna get comments that are like, you're an idiot and uh, your opinion is bad. I don't care. I just wanna tell you a story about a movie that I was dreading that was really important to me that it turned out I liked, because I kind of forgot that could happen. So the movie starts, and I, like, I don't know, I'm gonna like it yet. I, I've seen the trailer, and I've seen a clip of the new song that they added that wasn't in the original play, and I know that I don't hate either of those things. I know that the scene that makes me bawl my eyes out in the original play still made me cry in the trailer, like just a, just a split second of that scene. Yeah, that got me, so they did something right. And the clip that was a song, I could see that it wasn't filmed wrong the way that musical movies often film songs. And the movie starts with waving through a window. Which isn't the first song in Dear Evan Hansen. They cut out a song called Does Anybody Have a Map? Does anybody have a map? Anybody maybe happen to know how the hell to do this? And this is kind of my only major problem with this movie. Evan's mother in the play is one of the most important characters to me about like why I love the play and the, the bit that makes me cry is her. And they cut out two of the three songs in her arc. But so, okay, that's like, okay, that's one thing. That's a little annoying. And there's a few things at the start where I'm like, okay, that's a little annoying. They're, they're kind of pushed in closer than I would like. A big thing about Evan's performance is all of the ticks. He like twitches with his shirt and stuff in the play. And that isn't something that's needed in the movie, because that's just to telegraph that he's anxious to the back row. You don't really need that in the movie, but it's still, you've got the guy who's from the play doing the performance, and that's Bruno thing that shut up, shut up, people. Uh, so it feels weird not to have replicated his performance wholesale, but that's not what this movie is. And that's fine. I love movies and filmmaking, and I'm really interested in the idea of adaptations. I, I love it when an adaptation can manage to give you a completely new experience of something that you're already attached to. And whenever I used to listen to Dear Evan Hansen, I couldn't help but imagine what these songs would look like in a movie. When it's a play, you get used to not getting the micro-expressions, missing out on certain nuances. You can see Evan fidgeting from the back row, but that's very different from a close-up of Evan's hands drawing our attention to the fact that they're shaking. The tools being used are different. There wasn't a camera before, so the only thing telling you to look at Evan's hands was how clearly he conveyed the action. And to be clear, I don't think it's a matter of realism exactly. One is not more realistic or naturalistic than the other, but there's a line to be drawn in both cases for what we as an audience can reasonably accept to be sufficiently plausible. So when you're translating from one medium to the other, it's going to have to be adjusted. And I kind of love that that's the case. Like I said, analyzing adaptations, absolutely my shit. So waving through a window, it's pretty good, it's pretty good. Cause I'm tap, tap, tapping on the glass. I'm waving through a window. My one gripe with it is when it gets to the key change where he does the little spin, he doesn't do the little spin. My favorite part's the little spin. Will I ever make a sound? On the outside, oh, will I ever make a sound? On the outside. Release a little spin cut. And there's other things that are annoying me a little bit. Connor and Zoe's dad, he seems like a little bit more of an asshole than he is in the play. So I'm like, oh, that's annoying. Stick with that, that turns out not to be a problem. I think it's by around Sincerely Me when I realize that the Blu-ray of this movie is going to be something that I, like, cherish. <laughs> Dear Evan Hansen, we've been way too out of touch. Even if I don't like the movie as a whole, like, they're nailing the songs that I wanted them to nail. Sincerely Me is great. It's really great. Sincerely Me is the one I couldn't imagine beforehand how they were going to do it on screen. 
it's Connor singing from within emails that don't exist. So he's just kind of in the middle of Evan's room as like a ghost. But what they do instead is they have him walking through the school and cutting back and forth between him and the school and uh, Evan and Jared in, in Evan's room, which is like not as weird a way of doing it as I imagined. I imagined like a spotlight coming down in Evan's room and, and he, he is there in the room or some kind of uh, imaginary space like realm that exists only within that song so like i'm not gonna complain that it's a boring version of the song it's a good version of the song it's really fun to watch and it made me smile it, it, it i was i was smiling by the end of the song and that's it wasn't the same as the as the play that i like but it was having the effect on me that the play had in 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 different ways but before sincerely me you've got for forever which is honestly one I'm not really into in the play. Like, it sounds nice, but it would never be one that I would be super passionate. I'm not like, oh yeah, for forever. Yeah. And what they do in the movie is that they really make that song justify the turning point where Evan starts lying, which is a really tricky moment. Like, that's, you're not on board with Evan if that scene doesn't work. And it kind of doesn't work in the play. Like, you, I, I feel... Like, I wasn't on board with Evan lying. That doesn't take away from me liking the play. I, I always say that Evan in the play is making the wrong decisions, and by the time we get to Good For You, which is the song where everyone's yelling at him for having made the wrong decisions. Stop it, stop it, just let me out. He kind of deserves it, and the play is better for him having got that. But because we're more up close and personal with all of the characters in this scene than you can be when they're on stage, you feel more like this decision kind of makes sense. Because you're watching it in a play, you don't get close-ups of everybody reacting and him like reading their faces and judging how far he should go. You get that in the movie because you can get up close. That's something you can only do in the movie that you couldn't have done in the play. And that's what you want from a musical adaptation movie is something you couldn't have done outside of this medium. Here's a secret about the play. Evan's being an asshole. To a certain extent, you could argue that he's a victim of circumstance, but nah, Scott Pilgrim Syndrome. There are key points throughout the play where we as an audience recognize him to be making the wrong decision. We can understand why he makes them and see them as moments of weakness, but they are definitely wrong. There are protagonists in other stories who don't feel like sympathetic people making mistakes. They feel like assholes who are acting like assholes because that's fundamentally who they are as people. The story walks a fine line, but in my opinion, doesn't ultimately make Evan unlikable in that way. Another thing you can get in the movie that you can't get on stage is just little vignettes that feed into character arcs. So like the dad, he, he, I, I was saying he seemed kind of simplified at the start. They do take out his song, which is annoying. They, did, they do the whole lead up to the song and then they take it out. So I really hope they shot it and I really hope it's on the Blu-ray and the deleted scenes. I actually really hope there's an extended version uh, Blu-ray. Seems unlikely with 30 whatever percent on Rotten Tomatoes. But uh, if somebody who's <laughs> involved is watching, please. They do take out his song, but what they replace it with are these vignettes where like you see the dad walking through his office at work. You see uh, Zoe's mom walking through the grocery store, stuff like that. And it seems like pittance until you get to the point where the dad hasn't cried yet at all on screen about Connor. And during You Will Be Found, you have him seeing uh, Evan's video, walking through his office, walking home, and then hugging Amy Adams as, as all the music swells. And... Man, I cried. I cried. I, that song doesn't usually make me cry that much. It made me cry so much. I was, I was like loudly crying. <laughs> so you will be found like for forever. I think is maybe better than it was in the play in the movie. The movie also feels, uh, just generally tonally a lot different than the play, and not necessarily in a bad way. The play is funnier. It's sillier. Uh and also kind of more naturalistic. That doesn't sound like it would line up, but it kind of does. Evan, right? Evan. That's your name. Yes, it is, it's Evan, sorry. Why are you sorry? <laughs> because you said Evan, and then I said it, you know, I repeated it, which is just, that is so annoying when people do that, so. I'm Zoe. Yes, no, I know, so. 
You know. No, 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 just, I mean, I've seen you play guitar in jazz band. I love jazz band. I love jazz. Well, not all jazz, but definitely like jazz band jazz. That's so weird. I'm sorry. <laughs> you apologize a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean. It's fine. The dialogue just feels very real in the play in a way that it doesn't in the movie. Uh, just because of the way it's like cutting back and forth, it's very cleanly composed and shot reverse shot for conversations. I'm sorry about my brother. He's a psycho. Evan, right? So it loses uh, the intimacy that it has on stage. But at the same time, they don't have to be projecting the whole time, so you notice lines being delivered quieter and more gently than they ever could have on stage. Then it also gets a chance to expand on characters that are very basic in the play. So Jared uh, can now be in cutaway shots during other songs, which uh, doesn't sound like much, but it means that you know how he feels sort of more often through the, the movie than you do in the show, I think. And Alana is the big one, because she gets a new song, and she gets to do it twice. And she's very cartoonish in the play, but the first time that they do her new song, they use it to flesh her out, and also to make just sort of the whole handling of mental health feel a little bit more thoughtful in the movie than it is in the play. But so that's the first time, and it's not better than or even as good as any of the other songs. Uh, in the play. The parts we can't tell, we carry them well, but that doesn't mean they're not heavy. If they added this to get Best Original Song Oscar, that one's not gonna win it. But the second time they use it, I realize that this song is used to justify another decision that is a tricky decision because it's a bad decision and you need to have the context justify the character making that decision. And you don't get that so much in the play. Evan gives Alana the Dear Evan Hansen letter that is found with Connor's thought to be his note and that starts the whole thing. In the play, it Im immediately she's gonna post it and she's like, what are you talking about? I've gotta post it, I'm gonna go post this right now. Uh, to his face. And so when they do that song in the movie a second time, it feels like a more realistic, naturalistic, human version of her making that choice. And that's one of the things I really like about the movie, is that it doesn't feel like the play, it feels like a new version of the play, which doesn't do everything the way I would want it to as a representation of what I love about the play. But, since I have that, I now have another version, a different version of the play, that I get to watch. And I also like that version. There are also things in the play that I expected them to change. There's a few gay jokes in the play. They have a line in Sincerely Me that's but not because we're gay. No, not because we're gay. Which I knew was not exactly gonna fly. So what they did was they made Jared gay. And that actually kinda fixes everything. The same lines hit different, it changes the vibe completely, and I like it a lot. Why would you write that? I'm just trying to make it erotic. Look, if you can't take this seriously... Ugh, calm yourself, honey. It feels less mean now. <laughs> like, I love the original play, but it does feel less mean in the movie, and it feels more human in a lot of ways. Even though it feels less intimate in the dialogue, it does feel more realistic in all of the ways that a movie with actual set that you can see feels more realistic than a play that is on a stage, isn't in a house, isn't in a school. One of the things I noticed that was really interesting when the trailer came out was that you get to see the Murphy's house. And that's important because the Murphys are much better off than the Hansons. There is a class divide there that's a big part of the dynamic. And what you can do in a movie that they didn't do in the play is keep you aware of that divide because their house is a rich person's house and you can see that the whole time. And they can cut back and forth between, oh, here's the exterior of a big house, here's the exterior of a significantly smaller house. And so the visuals can do a lot of heavy lifting that uh, before the exposition had to carry completely on its shoulders. Another thing that kind of surprisingly feels better in the movie than the play is the relationship between Zoe and Evan. I say surprisingly because, uh, <laughs> let's talk about the thing. Evan is played by Ben Platt, who is the original Evan from the original cast Broadway version of Dear Evan Hansen. And this, I assume, is the main, uh, 
cause of the reaction that it's been getting, the low reviews, the bad reviews, are that he looks too old. So as an acknowledgement of bias, I love the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, so that's not really a problem that I have encountered watching movies is people looking too old. I don't care. But I do feel it's important that Ben Platt plays Evan in this movie because the original play version of Dear Evan Hansen, which as I've said, I've seen because there's a bootleg, it hasn't been filmed the way that Hamilton has. Hamilton, they sold the rights to somebody, they got a bunch of people in to shoot it properly and get the original cast filmed from all these different angles and it looks great and that's the best way you're ever going to be able to watch Hamilton. Dear Evan Hansen didn't get that and now it's too late. So all that you get is the bootleg. That's all there is of that. And Ben Platt's performance is a huge part of why the play works so well. That's not to say that the other Evans aren't good, they're all good, and I look forward to in 20 years when, god how old will I be, 40? Uh, somebody else gets to do it in a new movie version of it, if it gets that. I hope it will. This is long term, I kinda don't care, I got a movie I liked. But, so, because there isn't a filmed version of the play other than bootlegs, I do feel it's important for that performance to be captured in a permanent format. And so leading up to it, I have been on the side of, yeah, he, he should be Evan in the movie. Uh, I, I would be more worried about the movie if he wasn't Evan, I think. I might not like this movie if he wasn't Evan, thinking about it. <laughs> that I hadn't asked myself that question before. I don't know. So, with people perceiving him as, uh, like, an old guy in and amongst the students, which I don't, I, I didn't feel that, that relationship with Zoe, you would think would be creepier than it is in the play and that is what uh i've heard people imply about it in the movie i don't know i haven't actually read reviews but i have heard people say that and it it isn't creepier it's better than it was in the play because it's cleaner in the same way that the gay jokes got cleaner and i'm not gonna be like oh sjw's they ruined your enhancement no it's it's good that they did that i'm a fan of the original i don't mind that that stuff's in there, well, I kind of, I kind of mind with relationships. I, I don't know. I, I still like the play, and I'm, I'm not attacking the play for having those things. But I, I do appreciate that they took them out, that they cleaned it up, that they did it differently, that they handled it a bit more thoughtfully. And so that relationship does feel a lot less icky. Evan doesn't kiss Zoe first, Zoe kisses Evan first. He doesn't kiss her after. If I could tell her, they, they hug first and then they kiss. It, it doesn't feel like. He takes a leap. It feels like the relationship grows uh, in a, a healthy way that relationships should. They don't have the songs that they took out on the soundtrack, so that's worrying. Really hope they shot them. I really hope I get to see movie versions of especially Good For You. So I was talking about how important Good For You was. They did take out Good For You. And I could tell that they were going to at the beginning because they do a, a brass, like, a school band version of it in the background during a scene. And I'm like, oh, that's good for you. Oh, they're not going to do it, are they? And they don't. And that is an aspect of what I like that's missing from this play. I don't like that about it. But it's a different thing, so I still like it as a whole, even though it is missing stuff that I like. I can still watch the original. I'm still going to watch the original bootleg. Uh, but now I have a new version of it that is different and that I also like. Which is really amazing that that happened. I didn't expect it to happen. I was so sure I was gonna hate it. Like, when, this doesn't happen. The reviews aren't... I, I, a few times now, I have heard that the reviews for a thing I was looking forward to were bad. And I thought, oh, maybe that means that I can make a bright side review of it on my YouTube channel. Uh... And then, no, I didn't like it either, because a lot of the times they get bad reviews for good reason. Godzilla King of the Monsters got bad reviews. Very good reasons. I wholly disagree with the reviews this time. I, I do really, really love this movie. <laughs> and I didn't expect to. And I'm really happy that I did. So, the song that I mentioned earlier that's in the trailer that is the, the big song that makes me cry the most in the original play, it it, it is... If you haven't seen Dear Evan Hansen, but you have seen Hamilton, it's it's Quiet Uptown. <laughs> it is the climax of the movie, I think. Because it is the point where you know Evan's going to be okay. 
the way they did in the movie was a little bit disappointing to me. It still made me cry, mostly at the beginning. It didn't make me bawl my eyes out at the point where it usually makes me bawl my eyes out because it feels like it's missing that intimacy. They're not, like, they're crying through the whole song. They're not bursting into tears at that moment. And one thing that you get on stage that you're never going to get in a movie is that when the actors start crying on stage, it's impossible not to cry with them because they're genuinely crying on stage. And, like, that's a thing I don't understand about actors in general is how they're able to make themselves cry. I've, I've not been able to pull that off and I've tried. That's one of the great magic tricks. So, like, seeing it in a movie, it's like, yeah, oh, okay, they cried. Uh, seeing it on stage, it's like, <laughs> it's amazing. And honestly, they get a little bit of that in the movie. Not in So Big, So Small, which is, have I said the title of the song yet? It feels more restrained. It feels more shot over shot. It feels more they're not hugging until the very end of the song, when in the play he kind of spends a lot of the song they're they're cuddling it feels very warm and intimate and uh it is why that relationship evan and his mother's relationship is uh one of the most important things in the play to me that scene doesn't have it but words fail does have that because boy ben black goes hard with the crying there uh and yeah that feels like as much of the oh this feels real that you get on stage that you're gonna get in the uh in the movie version and so the last major thing that they change from the play to the movie is the ending they kind of extend it longer which feels nice because you get more time to know uh what happens after evan reveals to the world that he was lying because in the play you don't get much you get uh one conversation and that's kind of it in the movie you get to see him being okay and it does feel better. One of the things that they adapt visually, that they, they take out the line, in in the play, he says that he's been uh, reading all the books from a yearbook list that Connor said were all his favorite books. He's been reading all of Connor's favorite books. Uh, they take out that line, but they show him instead, like, pull, pulling up the yearbook, seeing the list, and reading all the books, which is great. That's a great visual version of a line that doesn't need to be expository dialogue. And one thing that felt very meta because this is towards the end something that felt really meta about that is that on the list of connor's favorite books is <laughs> ready player one which is a hated book that a lot of people that i like really really hate and love to make fun of which is a book that i really liked when i first read it as a teenager so I had this moment towards the end of this movie that I loved, that I knew as soon as I got out of the theater, oh, I have to explain why I loved this for the rest of my life because nobody else does. Inserted in there is this icon of something that I like that I can't really talk about to other people because everybody else hates it. I have a video about why I like Ready Player One. It's not going to convince you either. It's kind of not what this is. It'd be nice if it did. Like, <laughs> I like watching videos that convince me to give something a second chance. But that that's only really going to happen if you want to like the thing. That's something about the premise of this that I literally am only understanding right now. <laughs> oh no. Is that video essays uh, that are hot takes about a thing that everybody dislikes that uh, the person likes. You're only going to click on that and you're only going to watch that. Uh, if you vehemently disagree and want to disagree in the comments, or if you're intrigued, if you're like, oh, you liked that? Why? Tell me more. If you're kind of open to being brought over to their side. So uh, Ben from Canada, he made a video about Batman v Superman. That's exactly that. I was like, huh, he liked Batman v Superman? I, I didn't see it because I heard it was bad, but I would like to like it. And, uh, it worked. I watched that video, and then I watched Batman v Superman, and I enjoyed Batman v Superman way more than I would have. I believe how much a movie resonates with you relies heavily on your expectations, where you're at in your life, or even just how your day is going, what mood you're in at that moment, what your mindset is, and what you hope to get out of watching it, and what you weren't expecting to get out of it that you did. And that was also partly because, like, 
everything that is bad about Batman v Superman, I had heard ad nauseum from everybody else. So it didn't surprise me when I saw it. So it didn't really phase me when I saw it. So I had this experience where watching Batman v Superman where all these bad decisions are made, but they kind of just go by me and I'm like, eh. And then I enjoy the things that the movie does right because it does a few things right. So I don't know if I can do that for you, but I haven't really been thinking about it in that way all these years that I've been doing this. So the other way that they extend the ending, spoilers, I guess, they have Evan contact people that uh, actually knew Connor and he finds the other new song, uh, which is a song that Connor wrote. It's a good idea. I like that idea. And I kind of thought it was going to be Disappear because they cut out Disappear and Disappear's like, Disappear might be a bigger deal than Good For You cutting out. I, 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 I prefer Good For You. Disappear is like one that I feel like is a is big one for uh, people who like it. It is a lot like You Will Be Found and you kind of forget about it, but it's a good song and it's one that I sing to myself a lot. And that is now the last song of the play. It's a, it's a better song than uh, the anonymous ones. It does, that's got slightly more chance to get that best original song Oscar. Still not gonna get it. I mean, I, I don't think. I, I don't actually uh, care about the Oscars, so I, I don't know, maybe they will. And it does work as a new ending for Dear Evan Hansen. It, it feels like uh, they now have an answer to uh, was it worth it, was any of it real? Uh, because you have this glimpse into uh, Connor's perspective that sort of validates a lot of the spirit of all of the craziness that leads up to this point. The Connor Project, all of it. It feels a little less uh, defeated by the necessary destruction of everything that Evans built. It does feel weird to have a different song end the play than the song that usually ends the play, but it was originally just a reprise of For Forever, so it's kind of fine. Like, I like setups and payoffs and musicals, but um, I, I'm not attached enough to For Forever to love that reprise of it. And then that's it. That's the Dear Evan Hansen movie that I've been waiting for, that I was excited for, and then I was dreading and then it subverted my expectations in the good way, which is great. <laughs> I really didn't expect it. And I'm happy. Like, uh, I'm, not, I'm not making this video to be like, I'm mad for everyone else not seeing what I saw. I'm happy that I enjoyed this movie that I wanted to enjoy. I am disappointed that it might not launch Ben Platt's career the way I wanted it to. One of the things about his performance being permanently recorded was I was hoping that, oh, well, if everybody else can see how good he is, then he'll get to be in other cool stuff and we'll get more Ben Platt movies, which I want. Don't think that's going to happen now. Um, I hope, I hope Ben Platt gets more chances to prove himself and uh, gets to do more cool stuff. It is also disappointing that this movie is not everybody else getting to see what I love about a piece of art that's in a not very accessible format. Plays are not accessible. I'm stupidly lucky to have gotten to actually see it on Broadway. But I also think a lot of the reason that it's getting this backlash is that it is a divisive piece of art to begin with. And because it's not in an accessible format, you, it's really hard to see Dear Evan Hansen on a whim. You have to seek it out. And so yeah, there were already people saying it was bad before there was a movie. So I think part of what it is is that uh, people are seeing it on a whim or on a whim, whim. People are seeing it on a whim or because it's their job to see it and to tell people if it's good or not. I can't tell because I'm super invested in the play. And f for me, it was a version of that story that I like. I don't know how it lands if you don't know that. Again, that's not what this is. I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to tell you that it can work out. Just because everyone else says that the thing is bad doesn't mean you're not going to like it. it. It might mean that, but it won't always mean that. And you will have problems with the thing, but those problems don't override valid experience. 
So, you don't have to be as paranoid as me. You don't have to steer clear of the Rotten Tomatoes so that you have the unspoiled experience. Uh, like, that's... I, I, I'm I even, like, a tier below, like, people who refuse to watch trailers. I, uh, I, I do watch trailers. I like trailers a lot uh, as, a, as a video editor. But if you do hear that the reviews for a thing you're looking forward to are bad, um, know that it might still make you happy because this movie really made me happy i i had such a good day russell t davies is back writing doctor who that was this morning seth rogan is talking cock dear evan hansen the movie gets from me a approved out of ten nine that's it goodbye i love you subscribe <laughs> <laughs> that's the most parasocial exploitation i love you subscribe <laughs> <laughs> does, does anybody do that? <laughs>